The 7.4 notes deal with the oceanic zones and marine lifestyles. We're first going to touch on the different zones that make up the ocean. Uh, the ocean is divided up into zones based on its physical and biological conditions. Things like where the continental shelf is, and we can see here the continental shelf breaks up a zone. But then we also have the light penetration as we go deeper into the ocean. That kind of gives us a distinction of uh, a different zone based on temperature and also light. Now let's talk about the pelagic zone first. Now the pelagic zone includes all the open ocean. And one thing I tell students, if you're swimming in the ocean without touching the bottom, you're in the pelagic zone. Now the pelagic zone itself can be subdivided into two regions. First of all, you have the neuritic zone, which is the water mass that's directly over the continental shelves. Then you have the oceanic zone, which includes all the open ocean. Uh, this is the open water beyond the continental shelf. Now the oceanic zone itself is divided into depth zones. The surface layer, which is the epipelagic zone, or photic zone, because this is where light penetrates, uh, extends from the surface down to about 200 meters. The mesopelagic zone, and meso means middle zone, extends from about 200 to 1,000 meters. And its lowermost boundary is usually at the thermocline of about 12 degrees Celsius. The bathypelagic zone is even deeper. It extends from 1,000 or 1 kilometer to 4 kilometers deep into the ocean. So we're getting really deep here. But even beyond that, you have the abyssal pelagic zone, which is from 4 to 6 kilometers deep. And then the deepest of all the zones would be the hadal pelagic zone. And they can extend down to 11 kilometers deep. This would be within the deep sea trenches themselves. Now, the other major part of, of the ocean is the sea floor. So we've been talking about the pelagic zone. The pelagic is the water portion. The benthic includes the sea floor. And it's the sea floor from where you're standing on the beach all the way down to the very deepest parts of the ocean and the trenches. It, of course, can be subdivided into different zones. The one we're probably most familiar with is the littoral zone, also known as the intertidal zone. It covers the region between the low and high tide mark. So during high tide, the intertidal zone or littoral zone is underwater. During low tide, it's exposed to air. Now, as you go beyond the low tide mark, all the way out to the continental shelf, you have what's called the sublittoral zone or subtidal zone. Then, once you jump off that continental shelf and go down the continental slope, you're entering the bathal zone, and that extends down to four kilometers deep. And then the seafloor that goes beyond the bathal zone down to six kilometers is the abyssal zone. So notice these names are somewhat familiar to the pelagic zones. We've just dropped the pelagic term from them. And then the deepest seafloor in the ocean is the hadal zone, and it corresponds uh, to what's found in the oceanic trenches. Now here's that diagram I had showed you before. So let's quickly review what it is that we saw here. So the water portion of the ocean is called the pelagic zone. Okay, That's all the open water. The seafloor itself is called the benthic zone. Now if we focus on the pelagic zone, notice the pelagic can be divided up into the neuritic and the oceanic. The neuritic is over the continental shelf. The oceanic extends all the way out past the shelf. It's the major portion of the ocean. But we can then divide the oceanic into the photic or epipelagic zone. The mesopelagic goes down to about 1,000 meters. The bathypelagic. Then you have the abyssal pelagic. And then the hadopelagic is anything deeper than that. Now, looking at the benthic zone. It can be divided up into several regions as well, as well. Here is the littoral, which is in between low tide and high tide. So this is the littoral zone. The sublittoral includes all the ocean bottom out to the uh, con end, edge of the continental shelf. The bathal zone extends down 
to about 4,000 meters, or excuse me, 2,000. No, 4,000, that's right. Then the abyssal extends down here to where the edge of the trenches are. So those are the marine uh, or oceanic zones. Now to change our pace here a little bit, oh, I went backwards, we want to go forward. Uh, we want to take a look at what's called marine lifestyles. Okay, this is the kind of almost like the niche that different organisms play in the in the ocean, but not quite. Niches are a little bit more detailed. This just talks about really how they get around and so forth. There are three main types of lifestyles, plankton, nectin, and benthos. Now plankton, as we've kind of become familiar with, are any drifting organisms that inhabit the pelagic zone. So these are the ocean drifters. They can be subdivided into a couple of different types. First of all, you've got your phytoplankton, which would be these guys. Notice they're green because they've got chlorophyll. They're photosynthetic. Then we have our zooplankton. Zooplankton would be like this copepod that's pictured here. Now, the interesting thing about this copepod is that it's always going to be planktonic. So it spends its entire life, holo meaning entire, so its entire life is planktonic. So this little guy here will never uh, become benthic or become a strong swimmer. He's always going to be a weak drifting animal. That's different from this guy pictured here in the lower right hand corner. This is a crab larvae. So he is what we call meroplankton, which means in part. Mero means they only live their juvenile, the juvenile stage of their life is when they're drifters. Eventually, this thing is going to settle on the bottom and become a crab. So he'll live on the sea floor. So he's not always going to be a drifting planktonic animal. So that's what we mean by meroplankton. Now, nectin are the strong swimming animals. These don't drift. They can swim against currents. And they have adaptions that allow them, uh, adaptations that allow them to do that, such as a strong tail. We call that a lunate tail. Uh, very muscular. Um, we call this actual, this section is called the caudal peduncle and is very, very strong. It allows this sailfish to move his tail back and forth. And one thing that helps them to be hydrodynamic is this long rostrum that uh, is, you know, we all commonly call that the sword. But that kind of helps with um, be, allowing the animal to be hydrodynamic. So this is a classic example of a nectonic animal that swims fast. But nectin can include whales. It can also include squid because they can swim uh, pretty, pretty strongly as well. Now, anything that lives on the bottom is benthos. So um, benthos can be divided up into four different types of creatures. Epiflora would be benthic algae and plants, as you see pictured here. So epifauna, and the word epi means surface, fauna referring to animals. These are animals that live on the surface of the sea floor. Infauna refers to animals that live within the sea floor. So if you take a look at this picture that just appeared, here is the sea floor. So you've got this clam is down in the sand. You've got a worm, worm here that's in the sand. And again, another clam here, scallop. These are all buried in the sand. So they're in fauna. A fourth type is what we call myofauna. Myofauna are microscopic animals that actually live within the sand grains. So this is like one sand grain. So this is a microscopic view. And notice there's a whole bunch of little critters, worms and such, that live within these big sand grains. So those are the different uh, lifestyles in the ocean. So that wraps up our little unit on... 7.4, the oceanic zones and the marine lifestyles.